Good morning. Ah, there we go. Much better. Welcome to St. John Hill Church. I'm Dave Bittler. I'm the pastor here. If you're visiting with us, we wish you a special welcome. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, lots of announcements uh, in your bulletin. You'll see that uh, today is the day for Easter flowers. Um, if I can get my technology to cooperate with me. Um, so these need to be turned in uh, today with the money. So um, if you would like to uh, uh, have those, um, please get those in to us today. Um, Rose, do you want to say something about this one while I've got it? <laughs> And again, don't talk to me about that one because I'm not involved. And if you don't know why, just stick around and you'll figure it out. Um, please uh, do read through all of the announcements uh, in your bulletin. Uh, again, we are taking a, a special offering for uh, Ukraine, which can be um, done in the in the basket in the narthex. Um, also. Uh, please read the announcement about our old pew Bibles. Um, they are currently waiting for their next new home, uh, but if you have one that was maybe uh, dedicated to a family member um, that you would like for yourself, um, please contact Nikki and we'll, we'll make sure that we can uh, get those to you before they uh, get, um, get moved to their new home. Are there any other announcements? Next Sunday, uh, April 10th, is going to be our membership Sunday. That's Palm Sunday. If you would, again, if you'd like to become a member, there are sheets in the narthex uh, that have the list of questions that we ask of our members. Um, please just fill out the bottom part and return that to me as soon as possible. But uh, we'd love to have you join us uh, in membership here at Hill Church. Um, Wednesday, midweek, uh, our midweek Lenten service. Uh, this will be the final Wednesday. Um, following week, we'll be meeting on Monday, Thursday. Um, but again, we're, we're continuing to go through Don't Sing Songs to a Heavy Heart, how to relate to those who are suffering. Uh, so please feel free to join us at 7 o'clock this Wednesday and then 7 o'clock the following Thursday. Anything else? that I might be forgetting. Yes? Just the, anybody that would want to help fill the eggs for the egg hunt on Easter, we'll be doing that after church next Sunday. After church next Sunday, if you would like to help with uh, filling Easter eggs, um, and that's putting the candy in the eggs, not the candy in your mouth part, because um, I know some of you might. Um, yeah, if you'd like to help with that, that's next uh, next Sunday after church, next Sunday. Anything else? All right. Well, let's take a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship as we hear the prelude. <laughs>
Would you stand for our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Would you join me as we sing our opening hymn? It's number 47 in the Faith and Praise hymn. The words will also be on the wall behind us. Holy, holy, holy. Most holy God, we come before you this morning to praise your name for what you have done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, as we seek to praise, to sing, to pray, to worship as we give and to hear from your word, Father, would your name be praised, would your Son be glorified, would your Spirit work within us? We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we come before a holy God, we come to acknowledge our sin, and to repent before him this morning. I'd ask that you take your bulletin and join me in the prayer of confession that's found there. We'll pray that in unison. It'll also be on the wall behind me. Following that time, we'll take a few minutes to silently confess our sins to the Lord. I'll close us in prayer and offer us some words of assurance. So would you pray with me the prayer that's found in your bulletin? God of all history and eternity, whom we call upon even now, you are eternal, unchangeable, infinite, and almighty. 
you are completely wise, just, and good, an overflowing source of all goodness. We thank you for your covenant, which is never broken, and your love, which is never measurable. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquities, and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions, and our sins are ever before us. Against you, and you alone, have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Create in us a clean heart, O God. Put a new and bright spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence, and do not take away your Holy Spirit. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, and sustain in us the living spirit. Let's take a few moments to confess our own personal sins to God this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we ask this morning as we come before you with humble hearts that from the bounty of your grace and through the blood of Jesus Christ, would you hear our prayers of confession? Would your Spirit give us the spirit of repentance? Wash us whiter than snow. All for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from Isaiah chapter 25. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let us sing together the doxology. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Exodus chapter 12? Exodus chapter 12. It can be found on page 53 of the Bible that's in your pew. If you have been with us and following along, you might be slightly confused at the moment. You might say, well, wait, Pastor Dave, you skipped over Exodus chapter 11. And it may look like I did, and in fact, I did, but that doesn't mean we're not going to talk about Exodus 11, we're just going to push that one to next week. Um, I very rarely do this, but since we are celebrating the Lord's table this morning, uh, it will make much more sense if I talk about chapter, the first part of chapter 12 today, um, because what we will do in a few minutes has its origin in Exodus chapter 12. So let's hear the word of God this morning. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, Every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep 
or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted with its head, its head with its legs and its inner parts. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you with no, no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For anyone who eats what is leavened from the first day till the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. Seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders and said to them, Go, select lambs for yourselves according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it into the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel of the two doorposts, and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, as we come to submit ourselves to your word this morning, would you speak your truth directly to our hearts? Find them in our minds, engrave them in our souls, that we may know who you are, that we may know your great love for us. We ask all of this through Jesus, your Son. Amen. Well, 
what I skipped over in chapter 11, we'll talk about next week, is the announcement of the 10th plague, which is referred to here in chapter 12. And it's important that we don't miss the context. God's people are in Egypt. And for a time, they prospered and they grew. But then they became enslaved and oppressed. Because they were being ruled by someone other than God. Someone who did not fear the Lord. And so they are in this state of slavery, of oppression, and the Lord has heard their groanings. And the Lord has remembered his covenant. Not that he had forgotten it, but that he has now decided that the time is full for the people to be delivered from their slavery, from their oppression. And this is going to be such a momentous event that God says, not only am I going, you, are you going to see what I'm going to do, but I'm going to give you a perpetual reminder so that you do not forget that I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Because the Lord wants us to remember this event. He wanted his people to remember it. So he gives them very detailed instructions as to what to do. See, in order for God to bring people out of slavery to sin, in order for God to bring people out of the slavery that they experienced in Egypt, it was going to require sacrifice. In fact, the whole tenth plague is going to be seen as God's judgment on not only sin, but those who oppress his people. Paul tells us in Romans 3 that the, the wages of sin is death. We're told in Genesis 3 that when Adam and Eve you know, were tempted to eat, God had told them, if you eat of that tree... In that day, you will surely die. And because of that, death comes into the world. Because of that, spiritual death entered Adam and Eve, and they did eventually die. But God, in his mercy, he did not kill them that day. But what did he do? Instead of fig leaves, he kills an animal and he makes from animal skin clothing for them. A sacrifice was made to cover their guilt and their shame. And so here, to protect the people of Israel from the judgment that was going to come upon their oppressors, he tells them, a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for the household, a lamb without blemish, male, a year old. 
You may take it from the sheep or the goats. And on the 14th day of the month, you're going to kill it. Now, in, in sacrificial terms, the way they would kill animals for sacrifice is they would basically tie them up by their hind legs, hoist them into the air so that all the blood is running to their head, and with a very sharp knife or sword, they would cut the animal's throat and they would collect the blood. And, Moses, and God tells the people, then you shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of your house. So the two doorposts and the lintel of your house. You will cover the entryway to your house with the blood of this Passover lamb. You shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted with its head, with its legs, and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until morning. What's the big deal about eating it all? Well, God knows that there's a journey coming. And I don't know if you ever watch any of these survival shows where, you know, the guys go out and they put themselves into these hazardous situations and they're you know, trying to find their way to safety. And one of the big things that they say is that you've you got to replenish your calories. You've got to build up some And the best way to do that is with protein, is with meat. They have a long journey coming. He's like, eat it all. Don't save any. If you got anything left, you burn it. You and your family need to eat everything. You eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. God's like, I'm going to move. You got to be ready to go quickly. So gird yourself up and be ready to go. It is the Lord's Passover. And he goes on to say, I'm coming to strike the Egyptians with a great judgment. But the judgment is not meant for you. It will not be indiscriminate. When I see the blood of the Lamb, I will pass over your house. That's where we get the word Passover. It means that that judgment passed over your house so that it would only affect those who were not of the people of God, who were not covered by the blood of the Lamb. And then he says, this shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord, as a statute forever. See, why do we need this? Why, why do we need this? Because we are forgetful people, right? Especially when things are going well, we, we tend to forget. We tend to forget, and then we tend to think that, you know, everything's going good because I'm in control. I've got a pretty good handle on things. I'm doing okay. And then all of a sudden, we're not. And then we remember, oh, God, I need you. <laughs> Things are not in control. I'm out of control now. God, would you come and please, please retake control of this situation? As if God ever let control get away from him. We need the reminder. And you see, when Jesus walked the earth, on the night he was betrayed, it was in the middle of of this Passover feast. He had already told his disciples, go and make preparations. Now, if you know through Jewish history, all right, most of their conflicts, most of their feasts revolve around kind of one central theme. Somebody tried to kill us. 
we won, let's eat. That's generally the way the history goes. This one's no different. And Jesus was celebrating with his disciples. He said, I so long to, to desire to eat this Passover with you. But Jesus makes a little bit of a change in the normal celebration. Now, the, the entire Passover meal that, that has come down through, through the Jewish um, uh, liturgy is, is quite an event. If you ever get the chance to, um, you know, if you have some Jewish friends or something, they invite you to a Passover meal, take the opportunity to go. Um, it's quite a celebration, and it's not a, you know, it's not an hour-long thing. <laughs> it's, it's a long process. Right? It's a celebration. We, we celebrate a portion of that which represents what Jesus did for us. When Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he gets up. You know, and, and normally in the celebration, you know, what it says, it says, you know, when your children ask you, why do we do this? Right? In, the, in the normal Jewish household, it's usually the youngest son will come to his father and say, Father, why is this night different than all others? And the father will recount the story of Exodus chapter 12. Jesus comes to, to the point in the story where he takes a loaf of unleavened bread Which, if, if you know, you know in, in the Jewish tradition, there's a bag that has three loaves of and, and unleavened bread is what, what we use up here. It looks like a big cracker. Right? It's, it's actually a whole loaf of bread that has no leaven in it. It doesn't rise. And so there's three of these in this bag. And the father will take out the middle one and if you ask them why is it the middle one, they say, we don't know. If you ask a Christian, why do they take the middle one? They say, there's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. The Trinity, three in one. And he'll take that middle one. He'll break it. And they share it as a family. Jesus takes that one and he says something different. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Now, he's just been spending weeks talking to his disciples as they head to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. Hey guys, I'm going to be turned over to the authorities and I'm going to die. I'm going to be beaten I'm going to be spit upon, I'm going to be all this, and they're going to kill me. And the disciples, God bless them. Or as we say in the South, you know, bless your heart. You know, they just didn't get it. Even when Jesus says, but, but I will rise again. They didn't get that either. Because there's times where, you know, the gospel writers will tell us, they say, and they're wondering, you know, what? rising from the dead might mean. Now, this shouldn't be a surprise to them because they have seen Jesus raise people from the dead. But they don't get it. And now he's telling them in the upper room, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he takes the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. What's that cup normally represent? Well, that cup is to represent you know, the, the salvation of the people. See, the covenant that God is making with the people of Israel in the feast of the Passover was you were to take the blood of the lamb, and that blood was to cover 
the lintel and the two doorposts of your house. The lintel and the two doorposts of your house. You see it? 2,000 years before Jesus. Here are people with a hyssop branch making the sign of the cross on their house. You see it? Jesus comes and says, My blood is the, the blood of the new covenant. The book of Hebrews tells us it's a new and better covenant. Not one that's written on, on tablets of stone, but one that is written directly on our hearts that is for not just the Jewish people, but for all who will identify with the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. So Moses tells the elders to go, and the people worship, and they go and do just as he said. And so Paul tells us, he says, when you eat the bread, and when you drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For the Orthodox Jew who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, they're still eating the same bread, they're still drinking of the cup, waiting for the Messiah that has already appeared. But we don't proclaim what happened in Exodus 12. We proclaim what happened on Calvary when Jesus died in our place, because in Jesus dying for us and instituting the meal at his table, he said, I am going to bring you out from your bondage to sin. Because when Jesus died, the Gospels tell us that the curtain in the temple which is, was made of fabric that was supposed to be a hand's breadth. Okay? It's, it's not like your, your bed sheets, which are this thick. You know, it's the thickness of your hand. That temple which was to shield us from the presence of God, which only the high priest could, could, was allowed to enter in. That curtain in the temple is torn from top to bottom so that Jesus would be our high priest, our entrance into the presence of Almighty God through his body being broken for us, through his blood being shed for us. On that night, Jesus said, we remember the Old Covenant. But in understanding that one, you're going to understand this one. It's not that we disregard Exodus 12. We know what it uh, was, and we know what it symbolized, and we know what it was pointing us toward. And in looking back, we see it. It's almost impossible not to see it. But our deliverance from sin, the wages of sin is death. And Jesus paid that debt for us. We owed it. He paid it. And that's what grace is. Grace is when you get something that you don't deserve. Jesus didn't deserve to die. He was without sin. He was a lamb without blemish or spot. 
he met all the qualifications to be the sacrifice. And he was the only one who could meet those qualifications. And in taking our punishment, He takes all of our sin upon Himself. And in return, He gives us His righteousness. His moral perfection before God. Folks, there's a reason why we say that this is good news. Because it's not... Our salvation, our deliverance from sin is not based on anything that we have done. It's based on what He has done. This is His story. What we celebrate is His story. And when our story intersects with His story, then we receive all of the blessings after He takes all of our ugliness, all of our sin, all of our rebellion against God. He takes that on Himself, the punishment for that, and gives us His righteousness. When our story intersects with His story, His story becomes our story. And that's what He calls us to proclaim to a dying world. That there is release, there is freedom from that Slavery and oppression to sin. And it's found right here. It's not that this saves anybody. But this is the reminder of what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago. This is that perpetual memorial that God says, every time when you come together, remember what Jesus has done so that we don't forget that it's all about Him and not about us. That's what we celebrate. Even better than that, Jesus promises, this is my body and this is my blood. When you do this, we, are, we take His identity into ourselves so that His actual presence is, is with us when we celebrate this meal. He has promised His Spirit to be with us and His actual presence is with us. And not only do we get His righteousness, we get Him. So that when we leave here, we don't leave here as ourselves. We leave here as Christ in us. Folks, this is good news. This is what we celebrate. Sin tried to kill us. Jesus won. Let's eat. Would you join me as we affirm our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed? The words are found in your bulletin. It'll also be on the screen behind me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
this is the Lord's table. This is the commemoration of what Jesus did to bring us out from the oppression of sin. It is a representation that we stand under his blood. And that instead of receiving the judgment that we would rightly deserve, because of his blood, we are passed over in that judgment. And that we take for ourselves the righteousness of Christ. If that is you, if that is what you have come to believe and embrace in your heart as members of God's new covenant family, then this meal is a celebration for you. But if that does not describe you, if you haven't come to believe in what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, that that has no bearing or impact on your life, if you still believe that you are the one in control, then by participating in this meal, you would actually be inviting God's judgment on your life. And I wouldn't want you to do that. So I would invite you not to participate at this time, but to take this time to reflect on your need for a Savior. With that, would you join me in our prayer of thanksgiving? Lift up your hearts. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord God. Let us sing together the hymn. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before your table today, as a reminder to us of what you have done for us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Father, would you take these common elements before us? And Lord, would you set them apart from their common purpose to this special purpose which you have commanded us to observe? that they would be to us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
on the night when Jesus would, was betrayed, he had took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you have your communion cup, I would invite you to pull back the, the thin layer of cellophane on the top which will reveal the wafer. This is the body of Christ which was broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. blood that was poured out for you. This in remembrance of me. If you pull back on the larger tab, it will reveal the cup. The blood of Christ which was shed for you. Take and drink with thanksgiving. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy to us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the victory that was won by Jesus at the cross. We thank you that his story is now our story. Father, would the grace of your table go with us we may shine your light, the light of Jesus, into the world. We ask this in your name. Amen. As we come to our prayer time this morning, are there notes of praise or notes of concern that we can lift before family today? Let's go before the Lord and lift up these and any unspoken requests that you have on your hearts this morning. Would you join me in prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the love that has been poured out to us through the blood of Christ. Father, as your children and your family adopted by you, Father, we have come this morning to lift up Many concerns on our hearts this morning. Some, Lord, you have heard spoken. Some, Lord, you know are still heavy on our hearts. Father, spoken and unspoken, we lift them before you this morning, asking that in your great mercy and care, Father, that you would, you would lift these from us. Lord, that your presence would abide in us and give us hope and comfort, knowing, Lord, that you are good and that you will bring all things in accordance with your will. Father, we thank you for the assurance that we have of your promises, that you have promised to be with us to the end of the age. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples and so us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In response to God's word, would you stand as we sing our closing hymn, number 480 in your hymnal, Blessed Assurance.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.